the fame of King Arthur, as judged by the association of his name with locations in Britain, is greater than that of any other personage, save one. Only the devil is more often mentioned in local association than Arthur. That name, indeed, is almost ubiquitous, since it is to be found wherever local peculiarities exist which were not explicable to our forefathers, save by infernal agency. But the two names are distributed in a very different fashion. That of the devil is scattered impartially, being placed at random wherever thought suitable. That of Arthur is limited to certain districts in which, according to history or tradition, the hero lived or moved. This dissemination and limitation of the name must have some origin, and may be most obviously and reasonably explained by connecting them with an individual to whom it actually belonged. I hold Arthur to have been as real a person as Caesar or Cromwell, though less advantageously circumstanced for the recording of his deeds. The British chief lived in the dark interval between two civilizations, between the departure of the Romans from the island and the establishment of the Saxon polity. The West and the North, which were the seats of his exploits, were remote from what had been the centers of Roman learning, and it may be presumed that Arthur's fighting men were only less illiterate than the Saxons with whom they contended. There may have been priests among them, for Christianity had already reached Ireland and touched the western extremity of England, but the priests, if priests there were, were probably more religious than literate. There was no Xenophon in Arthur's army, and perhaps no one who could read or write. No manuscript has come down to us from Arthur's time and place, though we have reason to believe that among his contemporaries and immediate successors were some who could compose, and others who could learn, recite, and remember with advantages the deeds of a leader who made an impression on his countrymen, which will probably never be obliterated. What was crystallized in metre was easily remembered and handed down with something approaching to verbal accuracy, the narratives not so expressed gathered exaggeration as they went on, until in the course of time, both the facts and the fiction acquired the permanence of writing. Oral tradition is not to be ignored. Indeed, a large proportion of ancient history must have had this origin. Putting aside obvious and inevitable exaggerations, the general outlines of Arthur's story are consistent with historic probability and with his great fame, which cannot be otherwise explained. While, as will presently be seen, many details are strikingly confirmed by the correspondence of the topography with the traditions. For the story of King Arthur there must be some foundation, however the primary facts may have been distorted and exaggerated. Two rules may be safely laid down with regard to tradition. It usually has some truth to rest upon. That truth is not accurately presented to us but has been altered and probably magnified by verbal transmission. We may believe that Troy was besieged and captured by the Greeks, though we hesitate to accept the many instances of divine intervention which the siege afforded. We may believe that Ulysses met with many adventures at sea, though we may have our doubts concerning the Sirens and Polyphemus. The creative power of the mind is small. We are more ready to embellish than to invent. We may give to tradition a credence as to something which has an origin, in fact, though it is not always easy or possible to separate that fact from the superstructure by which it has been overlaid. In looking at the legend of King Arthur, one is immediately struck with its wide distribution. Originally of Celtic origin, it has taken root in certain localities and held its place in them, notwithstanding that the people among whom it originated have suffered admixture or even been entirely replaced by other races. In the lays of the Welsh bards, supposed to be as early as the 6th and 7th centuries, Arthur and his brave companions are celebrated, but modestly and without marvels. It is possible that there may have existed in the 6th century a prince bearing the already well-known heroic name, and if so, about him the myths belonging to the remote ancestor or god have crystallized. The legendary additions begin to gather in the history of the Britons by Nennius, a writer supposed to have lived at the beginning of the 7th century, but his history is a forgery of a much later date, probably of the 10th century. Next in order come the so-called Armoric collections of Walter, Archdeacon of Oxford, from which Geoffrey of Monmouth professes to translate, and in which the marvelous and supernatural elements largely prevail. Here for the first time, the magician Merlin comes into association with Arthur. According to Geoffrey, Arthur's father Uther conceiving a passion for Igerna, wife of Gaulois, Duke of Cornwall, is changed by Merlin into the likeness of Gaulois, 
and Arthur is the result. After his father's death, Arthur becomes paramount leader of the British and makes victorious expeditions to Scotland, Ireland, Denmark, Norway, and also to France, where he defeats a great Roman army. During his absence, his nephew, Modred Revolts and Sadducees, Prince Arthur's wife, Guinevere. Arthur returning falls in a battle with his nephew and is carried to the Isla of Avalon to be cured of his wounds. Geoffrey's work apparently gave birth to a multitude of fictions which came to be considered as quasi-historical traditions. From these, exaggerated by each succeeding age and recast by each narrator, sprung the famous metrical romances of the 12th and 13th centuries, first in French and afterward in English, from which modern notions of Arthur are derived. In these, his habitual residence is at Caerlon, on the Usk, in Wales, where with his beautiful wife Guinevere, he lives in splendid state, surrounded by hundreds of knights and beautiful ladies, who serve as patterns of valour, breeding and grace to all the world. Twelve knights, the bravest of the throng, form the centre of this retinue and sit with the king at a round table, the Knights of the Round Table. From the court of King Arthur, knights go forth to all countries in search of adventure, to protect women, chastise oppressors, liberate the enchanted, enchain giants and malicious dwarves, is their knightly mission. The earliest legends of Arthur's exploits are to be found in the Bardic Lays, attributed to the 6th and 7th centuries. A Welsh collection of stories called the Mabinogion of the 14th and 15th centuries, and translated into English by Lady Charlotte Guest in 1849, gives further Arthurian legends. Some of the stories have the character of chivalric romances and are therefore probably of French origin, while others bear the impress of a far higher antiquity, both as regards the manners they depict and the style of language in which they are composed. These latter rarely mention Arthur, but the former belong to the full-blown Arthurian romance. From France, the Arthurian romance spread also to Spain, Provence, Italy and the Netherlands, even into Iceland, and was again transplanted into England. One of the publications that issued from the press of Caxton was a collection of stories by Sir Thomas Mallory, either compiled by him in English from various of the later French prose romances or translated directly from an already existing French compendium. Copeland reprinted the work in 1557, and in 1634 the last of the black letter editions appeared. The conclusion is not to be avoided that at some remote time, imperfectly presented to us by history, one Arthur was a prominent person in the south of Scotland and the north of England, left his name widely scattered in the lowlands and fought many battles hereabouts.